That's me. Welcome to another episode of the Chrissy Mayer Podcast. We are on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, and SoundCloud. And if you're listening to us right now on iTunes, please go and leave a five-star review. They can say anything. Here's a good example from Minneapolis Joe. Um, Chrissy, I think you're missing out on a lot of YouTube views. <laughs> Wait a minute. That's not the one I wanted to read. <laughs> that was like read telling, that telling me to do something. Uh, all right, fine. I'll read them both. Chrissy, I think you're missing out on a lot of YouTube views using the premiere feature. It shows in my subscription timeline when you post it, regardless of when it goes live. So as I scroll through the videos and watch them in order, I can't watch CMP. Later when they go live, I've already moved on to the recent videos and end up missing some amazing content. All right, Minneapolis Joe, I'm going to look into that. Um, that sounds technical and nerdy, but I, I should figure out what that means here is another this is gonna be the funny one that i was gonna read this one is from on a ladder finding a nickname <laughs> their name of the review is called i dabble oh here we go uh first review i've ever left on a podcast and i also rarely laugh out loud at a podcast but when you said mm. i i dabble in your interview with stuttering john i lost it keep up the good work haha -ha! oh well thanks on a ladder that's um that makes my day i'm uh i'm super excited to read those exciting reviews. Um, guys, if you haven't already, um, subscribe on YouTube, follow me on all the things, social media at Chrissy Mayer, C-H-R-I-S-S-I-E-M-A-Y-R. -S 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 -E and speaking of following, you guys should really follow Silk City Hot Sauce. Go to SilkCityHotSauce.com, use the promo code CMP, you're going to get 15% off your entire order. Plus they're going to throw in a bottle of free cherry sriracha and some dope stickers. You guys, if you're looking for hot, you found it. Silk City Hot Sauce. Uh, go to the website now, enter the code CMP, get 15% off. These guys are super fun too. What I love about Silk City, they're also huge comedy fans. They're constantly retweeting episodes of the pod. Um, and they also make a delicious product. Speaking of delicious, Adam and Eve is here to say that the best part of staying at home is playing at home. Go to adamandeve.com, use the special code CMP at checkout so you can get almost any item online for 50% off. That's five zero. And when you use our discount code CMP, you're going to get bonus gifts like six spicy movies, a three piece bonus set. I think I got it. It has this make me come clit sensitizer, which I will put on if this podcast goes south. And I think this fun little vibrator and something else that's in my room. <laughs> Adam and Eve plus free delivery. Adam and Eve has thousands of gifts, toys, and movies to help us lock down some great sex. Make sure you go to adamandeve.com. Use the promo code CMP. Thank you. Guys, I'm so excited to have <clears throat> this guy on the pod today. Um, you've seen him on Letterman, Late Night with Karen O'Brien, Just for Laughs. He had a Comedy Central Presents. He was a correspondent at The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. He is the host of the Punchlines podcast, which delves into the psychology of comedy and combat uh, with a UFC fighter named Corey Sang Sandhagen. 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 It's Mitch Fatel. So you, you have... You're like big enough now that you have sponsors, huh? Because I'm oh, doing yes. a podcast and that, that's like the holy grail that you could get a sponsor. So how long did you have to do it before you got sponsors? Oh. Or is it just your, is it your mom's hot sauce and she just- No, I wish. My mom is dead. So she- <laughs> So is mine. My mom's dead too. Really? Oh no. What? How long Were you sad you? that your mom died? Yeah, I, I wasn't. Was... Yeah, you weren't? Wasn't. You guys weren't close? <clears throat> My mom was kind of, was mean. Really? Uh, that's, that's actually the case with like more and more comedians. comedians that I meet. Yeah. They have mom issues. <clears throat> and it's like, I get it. I for sure have issues because of my dad. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'll never judge anybody's parental issues because it, it's kind of hard for us not to have something from one of our yeah. parents. Yeah. Yeah. I said to my wife, I was like, it kind of scares me that I never even cried when she died. Like it made me realize how sad my childhood must have been that I didn't even cry when I lost my mom, who's the only reason you're here. Isn't that weird? When did she pass away? Well, I killed her, and that was about six months ago. Um, my mom passed January of this year. Oh, wow, January of this oh year. Oh my gosh, so really recently, wow. Yeah, yeah, really recent. Were you, where, how far apart do you guys live? <clears throat> well, now she's, six feet under so we 
live really far away from her. But um, before we lived, I lived in New York and she lived in Florida. Okay, yeah. that's classic, uh, classic old person move. My parents, my mom was diagnosed with cancer and then proceeded to move to Florida, like to a state yeah. with worse hospitals. I don't know what she and my dad were thinking. I, I imagine it was something along the lines of like, look, if you're going to die soon, we don't want to spend our last winter shoveling yeah. snow in Long Island. We want to be drinking pina coladas in a, in a uh, private you know, living area. What's it called <laughs> when you live in like uh, a private, nice area that's like a gated community? Yeah. Jews. It's called Jews. Well, we're not Jews, which is so funny. And uh, um, I think what happens Wait. is like the Jews go to Tampa and Palm Springs and Palm uh, Beach, yeah. I think. And then Boy Boynton Beach. Boynton Beach is where my mom was. And then the non-Jews. Well, I was raised like Methodist, but whatever. It was, you know barely anything and then they went to naples so i feel like a lot of the oh okay yeah types. there's a comedy club in naples do you play the yes, comedy club in naples? i have and the um the owner whatever booker of the comedy club has like famously shorted not famous only famous to me and the people i t talk about it too but he's shorted me on like um at least two gigs already in terms of money and i always say to myself like i'm never performing there again <laughs> and then i really want to see my visit my dad so i go yeah. oh fuck it let me just oh yeah it was rough like i um i think i was there last thanksgiving and uh like he wasn't there but whoever the the girl that was like the manager whoever else was like taking care of it was like oh yeah we normally pay our hosts like 150 so i'm sure like that's what that's what you're getting i was like all right cool and then like he calls her i don't hey, i should have just left i should have just ran out of there and been like great bye but i was like talking to fans and hanging out right. and like finishing a drink <clears throat> and um and like, apparently he called her to say like, oh no, it's, it's 75 for you. I don't, I don't know how you heard. It was more than that. Da, da, da. And I was like, wow. Um, you know, I'm one of the, I'm one of the rare people. And I've met a lot of comedians. I've never really had a money issue. I had one money issue very, very early in my career. And I was really proud of myself because I really fought for it. And I, and I remember getting it. It was a gig that I was an open micer and I was living in New York and I got a gig in Watertown, New York. And it was an eight hour. What a town. <laughs> it was an eight what hour car ride in freezing snow for $50. Okay. So this eight was like upstate. Ride. This was like yeah. heavily upstate. Okay. Yeah. yeah Watertown, if I remember, go ahead. Cause you're from New York. You're born and raised Yonkers, right? Yes, yeah, so I was City in boy. that area. Yeah. So, but anyway, so afterwards they said, uh, oh, no, no, you, we weren't supposed to pay. It was an open mic or something. <gasps> and How are you supposed to I, get? Oh, it's supposed to be 50 bucks, right? 50 bucks to drive eight hours, Chrissy. Holy and, uh, fuck. That barely, that's like maybe gas. That's, pro that's probably not even enough for gas. If you had like a Prius. And, uh, and um, I remember saying to the manager, and I remember like thinking like, where did I get the balls to say this? I said to the manager, <clears throat> you cannot pay me right now if you want, but I'm going to go back to New York. And this is all bluffing. I said, I'm going to go back to New York and I'm going to tell every single comic they should never work your club ever again. And no one will ever work your club. And this club will go out of business. It was just like a bar wow. or something. And I said, or you could give me $50. It's $50. $50 is up to you. If you think your business is worth $50. Wow. And the guy actually was like, uh, all right, I'll just give you fifty dollars. I but, yes! but that's not what was, and Good I was like, and you. I walked out going like, oh my god, I got my money. And so I've never, I've never ever gotten ripped off. Good for except, you, Mitch. It really is like it's a real skill to be able to stand up for yourself. And I think a lot of us are raised just without that skill. And you want to just avoid conflict, and you deal with sometimes I'm not worth yeah. it, or oh they're right about me, or whatever it is. And it takes some people their entire lives to to work on that or yeah, get over but that. The weird thing is, is I didn't, yeah, I'm not the kind of person who usually would do that, but it just really seemed, it seemed really, really, really wrong to me. And then the other really funny, oh, I do have a, another funny money story. How many years in a comedy were you for this $50 spot at this Two point? years. Okay, yeah, you're worth 50 bucks to drive. You know what I mean? Like that's not crazy. Yeah, but the, the weird thing is, is I would have taken it for $20 but it was just the fact that I, in principle, it was offered to me. 
And I felt like that I just had this whole thing like that. So it was agreed to. Yeah, you were tricked. <clears throat> that's that's a shady, that's a shady dude right there. Can I tell you my really other funny payment story? Yes. Uh, so my other funny one was so I got a gig for seventy-five dollars. So so where are you from, Chrissy? Long Island, Rockville Center. Oh, okay, so, so yeah. you know that there was a booker named John Schuler for a while? That sounds familiar. Was he um, a city guy? No, he was a he was a Connecticut. He was a guy that would like lived in Connecticut, and he would get you gigs at like the crappiest bars and stuff. It's where you're supposed to start out, you know. Like, okay, so yeah, he just, was like a beginning sort of like pimp, I guess. Yeah, he dabbled in booking. <laughs> so he Get was out a my dabbler. Coffee. Oh boy. So <laughs> so. So he called me up and he said, I got you a gig at $75 at the 50 yard line. That's the name of the bar, 50 yard line. <clears throat> and I showed up and I wasn't a sports fan. I kind of been a little into sports lately. I mean, before COVID and before Black Lives Matter. And, um, and, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and so I didn't know that they were having March Madness when, you know, the basketball teams, the college basketball teams. <clears throat> and um, it was the final. I was supposed to perform there on the final of the final four and wow. the stage was right in front of a big screen that had the basketball game going with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people cheering on the, the game, the basketball game. So I remember walking in going like, well, are you guys going to turn off the TV when we go on? Oh, that's number one. Come on. Yeah. And the, and the guy said, no. I mean, think about it. The people that want to watch the basketball game will watch the basketball game. And the people that want to watch the comedy will watch the comedy. Like he, and, and God bless him, he really believed it. You could tell in his heart that that was like, yeah. <laughs> like people want to watch the comedy, they'll watch the comedy. So I was like, okay. And, you know, this is the shit we would eat early in our careers. And, um, and I remember going on stage in the middle of a game and, and doing my act and hearing people cheering for the game, but like five or 10 minutes into it, I started to realize like, I'm doing okay. Like nobody's booing me off the stage and there are people laughing, wow. but I was screaming because I had to scream over the people that were cheering at the screen for the basketball game. And, um, and I was so proud of myself, Christy. Like I got off and I was like, oh my God, I, this is what it takes to be a comedian. Like I went on in front of like an audience cheering on a basketball team and I did good. <clears throat> the owner takes me in the back to pay me my $75 and goes, that was great, man. I told you it would work out. I told you it was good. And I was really hot. I was really so excited. And he said to me, um, all right, so what do you want to do? Like one, do 50. And I said, <gasps> and I said, well, I was supposed to get 75. And he goes, yeah, but you were supposed to do 30 minutes. You did 22 minutes. And I said to him, oh, and, mind my you, God. and I, could, I couldn't speak, by the way, because my voice was so sore from yelling. And I said to him, but I couldn't even talk anymore. I did, you know, whatever. Yeah, and he said yelling. to me, I said to him, I lost my voice, but I did the job. I mean, like 22 minutes or 30 yeah. minutes. And I remember he said to me, I'll give you $75, but you'll never be back here. Are you okay with that? And I remember going, yeah, I'm okay with that. <laughs> like, like that's a think... threat. Like, oh, I can't come back to your fucking shitty bar where you actively try to thwart my success by keeping the TV on. Wow. So if there's anybody in Connecticut that still goes to a club called the 50 yard line, if it's even open, oh my God, uh, I have to tell that guy it. to fuck himself. <laughs> Good. Yes. Even years later. See, this is what comedy people who, who have shows and bookers don't know is that we will be talking about this shit for years to come. Mm -hmm. We don't, yeah. we don't forget names. We don't forget faces. <sighs> we don't forget that you have like a, you call yourself a dumb nickname, like the fucking captain. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. 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 Same guy in Naples, um, same club, right? Uh, it might have been my second time performing there. And that was, it, this is when Jeremy Piven started to do stand up. And this was the first club he had ever headlined at. And I'll like never forget it because I was like, wow, everyone's excited to see him. There were right. like maybe five of us openers. Because again, I was visiting my folks yeah, in Florida. Yeah. I was like, cool, I'll get, I would love to do a spot. I'm here from out of town. Um, there were like five of us openers. 
And I think people were starting to like um, leave because they were like, oh, where the hell is Jeremy Piven? He's used to, he should be headlining by now, right? But there were five of us openers because he could only do like 18 because, minutes. Right. He could only do 18 saying. minutes, you know, which is fine. But like, <laughs> yeah. don't be the marquee headliner if you can't do the time yet. Um, but this guy, agree. that just speaks to like the quality of, of man this guy is that he's going to like juice Piven's name to fill a room when he can only can barely get through a feature set but that was fine you know just call it a showcase or something a showcase starring Jeremy whatever and um so at the end yeah he like I think it was like he wouldn't I, I had done a bunch of shows and he like wouldn't pay me again short of me wouldn't pay me the full amount I think he wanted to pay me less than $50 less than he agreed to and his whole thing was like well you walked people that one night you know because you were so bad I was like I think it was because people were upset the headliner wasn't on stage yet like I didn't say anything crazy I am not a graphic comic I don't even talk about I don't talk about my pussy I don't curse like yeah. maybe there's adult themes but like yeah. nothing that's gonna walk a room nothing crazy controversial so i was i could not believe this dude you know and like oh they keep, i keep working the club but now i might truly be uh done now that i yeah i've noticed whenever i talk about my pussy i walk the club usually too oh my god i just feel like i don't know off topic i, I hate to say oh this person's misogynistic because i feel like that's always like a, a lame card to play and it, i think it makes you sound like a victim when you go there because I don't think, you know, you you put your own limits on yourself, right? But I, the more I talked about it with other people, the more they were like, yeah, he doesn't like women. And I'm like, Ugh, but I don't know, who gives a shit? But anyway, Mitch, you're going to be in uh, St. Louis at Helium this weekend, yeah. October 1st through 3rd. I also am doing shows this weekend. I'm going to be in Atlantic City doing the Comedians of the Compound. That's August 2nd and 3rd, this Friday and Saturday. Please buy tickets. If you're in St. Louis or near Atlantic City, you better be seeing either me or Mitch this weekend. Um, yeah, come see us. Come see We're us. funny. We don't talk about our pussy. Jeremy nope. Piven won't be there. Stuttering <laughs> John won't be there. Stuttering we'll John. Be, us being funny. <laughs> Will not be there. So, like, what was the extent to which you worked with Stuttering John? I know that he was an intern at Stern after you left, or was it during yeah, the same so time? Yeah, so I so I was working on the Howard Stern show for a very brief period. Um, like, I did it for, like, six months. And I was an intern and John and me were classmates in, uh, in NYU. And we weren't, I wish I could remember more about him then. I don't remember a lot about him except that he's a little bit annoying. And I remember that he was impressed that I was working for Howard, working, you know, as an intern. Were you guys the same and age? Yeah, we were the same age. Yeah. And um, I think we were. I mean, you know, we were both in college. And, uh, and I, and he said, and I, and I crashed my car. I was going into work one day. And uh, you know, when you get older, and you realize, like, all the things you thought you should do as a kid, you realize, like, we shouldn't have been allowed to do that. You really shouldn't drive until you're 30. Like, no, you just have yeah. no idea how to drive. It's and so I was true. driving. Yeah. And I was driving in all this stupid stuff that used to be like when you're 18, like we should get the right to do this. And you're like, nah, you really shouldn't when you get older. You, you get it when you get older. But anyway, so I was driving in a storm, a, a rainstorm, and, uh, and I just was going way too fast. And I s spun out, should have died, uh, <laughs> hit the back of a tree. If I'd hit the front of the tree, I'd be dead. And I, had, and I totaled my car. And so I couldn't go into work anymore. So I had to quit the Howard Stern show. Oh man, that was why? Yeah, I had no way to get in anymore. You couldn't take the bus or the train? <clears throat> um, no, I don't think I could. Oh, uh, yeah, because the Howard Stern show, I used to have to get in at three in the morning. I lived in Rockland County. That was an hour ride. There was, I couldn't, I was like 18 years old. I couldn't take a bus into the mm. city. Yeah, it was just, it was, I just couldn't do it. I guess it's a it lot for a youngster, yeah. Yeah. And so I had to leave. John found out I was, I said to John one day, I'm leaving. And he said, oh, can you get me the job? And I went into Howard and I was like, hey, there's this kid, this kid, this guy that is in my class and he kind of wants to work for you. I go, but the only problem is, is he kind of has a stutter. And, uh, and before I could say the, the word stutter, he actually said, hire him. 
he didn't even meet him. He just knew, Howard knew that that would be hysterical. Wow. And, uh, and, Wait, so and, before yeah. you said he has a stutter, you were like, he has a, and then he just I said, stutter, stutter. Uh-huh. I said, I said, stutter. And he's like, hire him. I, that's it. I want him. And, and he went on to great, great, great success <clears throat> that I could have never imagined. Howard know, like, or John? John. Oh, you know, right. Because he I went on that, to announce. I don't the, think uh, anyone show. expected John, including himself and his parents, to do much. And all of a sudden, he was really famous, and uh, and and he was good. He was really good at that job. He was really good at that job. So you know, the intern job or the announcing job. Yeah, yeah, the the intern job. I think. Yeah. What kind of stuff did you guys have to do? Well, my job, John took it to a whole new level. You know, my job was just kind of inane, boring stuff. I used to have to make Howard's potatoes. <laughs> make his he potatoes? A, he was on a special diet when I worked on there. And you know what's so funny, Chrissy, is like, I was really embarrassed for it for a while, telling people that after. And then I realized, like, as you get older, like, those are the moments you should be so proud of. Yes. Because those are the moments where you showed who you were, your medal, yeah. how much you wanted mm-hmm. something. And It's actually it's, so cool. Like, looking back, because I was an intern for a late night at Conan O'Brien. And I was like, oh, looking cool. at your credits, what year did you do it? Howard? Yeah. No, what did you, what year did you do Conan? Because I wonder if I was interning at the same time that you did the show. 96. Oh, okay. I was after that. I was interning uh, like 2004, hey, 2005. Maybe it's 2006. Maybe it's 2006. 2006, not 96. I'm sorry. I'm not that old. Okay. So, wow. It must have been like right after me. I was there like 04, 05, um, my yeah, senior yeah, year, two, college. Yeah. I think it was 2006. I'm not... I'm not trying to couch any dates. I just don't remember anymore. <laughs> I, I wasn't, I, the, the Conan O'Brien show holds a very special memory for me because it, it's, a, it's a story that most people think is very heroic that looking back, I think is a very stupid what I did, but it just goes to show, I think how youth is very idealistic. So when I was a little boy growing up, I used to watch the Letterman show every night at 1230. I had a very bad childhood. My mom was very mean to me. So I would watch the Letterman show at 1230 every night while they were asleep. It was the only peaceful time I, I, I had. And then they I remember knew? I used to, they knew my parents. Were, they knew you were watching it? I don't think they cared. I would watch that and then porn. Basically, that was my life. Oh, my God. A 15, how old? Oh, 15. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that's 15 or 16. That's so, uh, and I remember thinking I'm going to be a stand-up comedian one day and, and David Letterman, who's my hero, is going to say my name. He's going to say my wow. name. I remember thinking that I'm going to make that happen. Fast forward, you know, 15 years or whatever. And I was starting to be a very successful comedian in New York City. And I got a call from my agent and she said, the Conan O'Brien show wants you. I had no TV credits as a young comedian. And I said to my agent, turn it down. And my <laughs> agent said, what? what do you, why would you turn, like the most confused I've ever heard an agent's voice. <laughs> why would you, why, why would I tell him you're turning it down? And I said, the first person that's ever gonna say my name on television is gonna be David Letterman. Aww. I and know, so see, you didn't like do it? Gonna, or You didn't do it or you so, ended up? So they went to the Conan O'Brien show and they said, Mitch is turning it down. And they said, why? And they said, and she was honest. She's like, he wants his first show ever to be on Letterman. And then they said, well, is he, is he booked on Letterman? And she said, no. And they said, well, what if he never gets Letterman? And her whole agency Aww. called me and got me on the phone and I wouldn't agree. I love that. S- I know it sounds like a good story now, but now I realize show business is so tough. It has a beautiful ending. Six months later, I got the Letterman show. Wow. Six months later, I sat in the wings and watched David Letterman. And I thought to myself, in five seconds, he's about to say my name. Oh, my God. And I, it's such a moment. Wow. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. It's like, it's like but, a moment where you like, you know, you give your little kid self a hug and you're like, it's okay, I got you. Like, that's so great. Yeah, but can I say something else? It's also hurt me a lot, that personality type, because then what I wound up doing is saying, I, I, I thought everything will always work out the way you want it to. So I was starting to get very successful. And then I, and then I got a call from 
my agent and they said, there's a new show starting and they want you to be a part of it. It's called Last Comic Standing. And I, it's the first season, Chrissy. And I said, wow. what is it? And they said, it's a game show where comedians are going to live in a house. And I said, no, I don't want to do it. That's not how comedy should be. <laughs> That's a, comedians shouldn't have to be in a house vying against each other. And it, anyway, if I had done that show, it probably would have been great for me. Um, and wow, I think but you had career, principles, you know, you had standards, which is something I've never had. I would have been like, yes, you know, stand outside with a sign, I'm there. I but I don't know if that's good or not, because the advice I would give young comedians these days is you, you take anything you can get because it's so hard. I was so idealistic, Chrissy, that I didn't realize how hard it actually was to do. So I was just flying by the seat of my pants and looking back, I'm like, that was very disrespectful of the Conan O'Brien show. I know it was a great moment, mm -hmm. but in a sense, it's like, it's almost like to me, like I'm a big UFC fan. And it's almost to me like when two people are trash talking and one destroys the other and then gets over him and starts taunting him. I'm always mm -hmm. like, you, you, you proved what you needed to prove already. Now be kind of classy about it. Like yeah. I kind of feel like it goes too far to the other end. And I think I was almost too boastful. Like I could turn down shit. I'm so good. Yeah. And in a way, I think mm -hmm. that was bad. Do you think that maybe you got a couple things too early or? No, I never got anything too early. I just... I got it too late. I mean, I was, I've been busting my ass. I started doing stand up when I was 15 years old. And wow. so I got the Tonight yeah. Show. I mean, sorry, I'm sorry, the Letterman Show. I think I was like 30. I mean, I oh, worked yeah. my ass. Oh, yeah. You were like it, so. ready, beyond ready. Yeah. Wow. So I'm how, 26, how, 26, 27. How often were you getting up at 15 years old? So when I was 15, I told my mom I wanted to be a stand up comedian. And they both told me that I couldn't do it because I wasn't. Because my parents, I don't know about your parents, but I know they're dead, but I know my One is parents, dead. My dad's alive. Your dad's alive? But he doesn't, I don't, you know, he's not like a dynamic parent. He's like, he doesn't really care what I do. He just wants me to be able to like support myself financially. So Is he proud of you? Does he tell you he's proud of you? Not really, no. Maybe once a year when he's had too much to drink at a holiday, he'll be like, <laughs> you're doing what you love. You know, it'll be one of those, but... <laughs> That's awesome. I want one of those. <laughs> Can your dad call me on my birthday drunk and give me one of those? Yes, that would be great. Yeah, he's good. I mean, growing up, he was always very good at like, um, you know, talking about the love languages, like acts of service, right? He would, he would check your oil tank. He would fix your car, all that. He would drive me to diving practice, but like never talk to me about my feelings. Never like any of yeah. that stuff. Acknowledgement, you know? So. Feelings. Yeah, yeah, I just learned to, you know, get it from elsewhere. I think that's part of what attracted me to stand yeah. up. I was like, oh, cool, mm -hmm. all this validation. It's either this or porn. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact, my wife and I constantly say if our son, who has given me more happiness than any comedy career I've ever had in my life. Wow. He's three. We say if he wants to go into stand up, we've really messed up. Like, Kind of, yeah. I mean, you know, like, like, in a sense, that he was l looking for something, you know? Yeah, I mean, I know that the reason why I wanted to be famous was I had such a miserable childhood that I was like, I just want to be loved, and it, people are going to love me, and wherever I go. And I, I mean, I remember thirsting so much for the validation that I never had from a family, from my mom and dad, that I remember the first compliment, you probably do too, the first compliment you ever got at stand-up, what was oh, yours? I thought you meant the first compliment I ever got, ever, which I also remember that. <laughs> what was that one? Um, I was on the diving team. I was 11 years old, and one of the older guys on the team, maybe he was 16 or 17, he like leaned over and said to me, he's like, hey, you're going to be really hot one day. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> oh, my God. That's yeah. horrible. <laughs> I think that was me. And I was like, can and I then... jerk you off poorly in three years? <laughs> great yeah so did you start well we may have a lot more in common than i thought did you start having sex younger than you probably should have i started giving blow jobs and hand jobs way younger than i should have i was 14 i never got yeah. to talk from any parents and again it was the same right. thing like feeling the peer pressure wanting to be cool wanting to be like cool with the with the boys but at the same time yeah. like not valuing myself enough to like listen yeah. to myself and be like, i'm not comfortable with this this doesn't feel good no like no right. never crossed my mind i was like time to be cool chrissy time to step up and learn a new skill 
Um, yeah. But then I didn't have sex until I was in college, until I was like a junior or a senior in college. So. Well, good for you for waiting for that, because now you don't have any kids, right? No. When I'm a, a step girlfriend. I have a, I observe my boyfriend's son like every other weekend. When you, hopefully you'll have a kid one day because it, the world, I hate to be all weird, but the world suddenly comes in a focus of who you were as a child Ooh. And, and it really, really helps you. It helps you. And I realized same as you. So I was 13 and I had a 13 year old girlfriend who would just give me blowjobs every couple of days she'd come over from school and she'd just blow me i didn't where is ask, she Chrissy. now how did you let this woman go <laughs> she was murdered when she's 19 years old by her boyfriend no oh my god that's yeah. horrible i think because she told this true story i think she told no she was she was a, this is my point she's giving blowjobs at 13 and i was accepting blowjobs at 13 because we were troubled kids we you know i remember her dad was nuts and, wow. and I, yeah. and, and, and so looking back, I'm like, man, that's way too young to be doing that. It's like, way too it's young. Way Any, too young. Anytime I see like a 14 year old looking girl, I just, I'm like, uh, like my Did heart you breaks. See cuties? Did you see cuties? No, I saw the fucking promo and I'm really torn on whether or not to see it because I've heard a couple friends say, okay, it's really not as salacious as Netflix is making it look. It's arty. There's a, it, there's a point to it. It's illuminating this larger problem. Um, and then part of me is like, well, this is fucking pedo bait. You know, like I'm upset that this exists. Um, well, I started to watch it because I was like, because I'm classic. I'm classic, like, have to see something before you make an ad, before you make a decision. And I hate any, you know, and, and quite honestly, like, one of my favorite movies of all time is Brokeback Mountain. I thought and you were I remember, <laughs> and I remember, I remember thinking, like, oh, this is just some gay movie that they're pushing on us to whatever, but I'm going to watch it before I make an opinion. And I watched it. Did you see Brokeback Mountain? Um, I think I've seen parts of it. I know the the premise. I know that like the two dudes, it's, cowboy dudes it's fall in just love. The, it's a great movie. Like it's just undeniably Do you see them blow movie. each other? Do you see like dicks or if anything? If you pay extra, if you get the director's cut. All right, um, all right. I'm interested. But, but I remember watching it and going like, I love this movie. It's a beautiful movie. It's just a great love story. Whether you're gay or not, you have mm -hmm. to watch it and go, Heath Ledger's insanely good. Yeah. Gillen, it's one of the best movies of all time. Maybe one of my top movies of all time. And even my wife makes fun of me for that. But so I did the same thing with Cuties. I was like, okay, let me watch it. Maybe it's a great movie. I did the same thing with Girls, the show Girls with Leah Dunham. I hated Leah Dunham so much. And I was like, let me see this show Girls. And halfway into it, I was like, this is one of the best written shows I've ever watched in my wow, life. Wow, good and for you. And I became you. a huge fan of Girls. You, you've seen Girls, I right? have seen, yeah, I have seen episodes of it. I didn't, I didn't watch it, like, front to back. Um, but yeah. I love it. And so, so I know that my mind is, if something's great, I'll watch it. So I started Cuties going, I'm going to see what it is before I comment on it. And maybe it's like having a kid but as like 20 minutes 30 minutes into it there's a scene and i was like I is it can't like watch. the final dance scene is it when they're in the uh, no it's like, not even the final it's 30 minutes into it they're just it they have because i know there's girls. highlights like there's there's a girl who like she gets pissed and then takes a picture of her vagina at 11 and posts it online like no i didn't see that i didn't get to that part i got 20 or 25 minutes in and i was like this is clearly, if it doesn't upset you watching young girls being sexual, I don't care what the point of it is, but if it doesn't feel weird to you, then that's weird to me. And that's mm -hmm. what I thought as I was like, I yeah. just thought if you don't think that that's odd, to, it, it, it just- Why it is it, really yeah. Why do we need art in our lives that kind of force our eye in a way to view something in a way we wouldn't normally view it. Healthy people wouldn't normally. Right. I think that's a great way to put it, yeah. You know, like why do we need, it's almost like reverse bird box in a way where it's just like, uh, or maybe it's regular bird box, I can't tell. But like, everyone's like, no, I don't wanna see it. And Netflix is like, you must, you know? And we're like, oh God, they're kids. You know? And I got, and you know something, I actually got the point of it because I've become much more conservative in my views as I've gotten older, which is a classic thing that happens to people because you start to see the world clear and when you have a kid. And I, I got the premise of it and I was like, it makes a lot of sense. These women, these little girls, I get it. Watch like, you know, uh, 
Cardi B and all these like women doing these mm. humping moves constantly. I'm such an yeah. old man. Do whatever it. the humping moves, the twerking, humpin', as they call it. The humping dolls. <laughs> A and, they, and, they start to, and they start to emulate that. And I got that. But at the same time, I thought, but I don't, even if you tell me like, yeah, but young kids watching porn start to jerk off. I don't need to see a young kid jerking off and go, well, it's art because it's showing that he, this is what the world shows him. So it felt very- Is there a kid jerking off in this movie? Oh my God. I definitely would have watched to the end if that happened, but no. <laughs> um, but that's my point is that if Ooh. they had made a movie with a young kid doing that, they can't just say, well, it's art. And so I was like, so where's the point where you go, okay, I get what you're trying to say, but if you're a person that cares about kids, like, would you, why would that be okay for you to watch? It just and the made argument, me feel sad. Yeah, the argument sad. is, it, it made me feel sad too, that from the moment I saw the very first, like even months ago, like the first wave of people being angry about it, like most recently was like the second wave because it was about to come out. But it made me like really sad in my heart and soul because I was yes. like, yes, this is a thing exists that exists. Sure, there's a way to make this artistic, whatever, it's fucking French, Sundance, all that happy bullshit. But I was right. like, why do we have to like shine a light on it? Like I'm big on like law of attraction and the secret and shit. And like, whatever you think about expands, whatever you focus on, you get more of. So it's like, why are we creating art out of a fucking terrible thing? It's like, it's almost in a way it's like, and I mean, it looks like it's trying to normalize this kind of behavior. It looks like it's making it okay for grown men and women to watch this thing. It's TV MA, it's mature viewing of 11 year old girls. So it's like, yeah. and it's like, we have a huge pedophilia problem internationally. Hundreds of thousands of kids go missing every yeah. year. I, and, and, and you know, Chrissy, it's just like, and I'm not the kind of person <clears throat> because I've learned in my years that the Twitter wars and the Facebook wars and stuff, it's just, it's endless. And I know if I went on and said, and joined the club, like, this is unacceptable. I'd have a thousand people that felt, vir you know, virtual signaling, mm -hmm. uh, telling me how I, I don't get that it's art. And I, said, and I was like, I was like, I don't want to get a part of that. All I'm going to tell you is in my heart, it made me feel sad. And I felt if it doesn't make you feel sad seeing that, and I mean sad that to see young girls, childhoods ripped away from them because they're all of a sudden sticking their asses up in the air, in, in the, you know, position that they're there to get fucked and they're 11-year-old yeah. girls, then in my mind, if that doesn't make you sad, then something's, I think, missing in your head a little. That's what's sad because it's like the very, um, it's a very blatant example. It's like you can watch it in real time, somebody's childhood being ripped away from them. And it's like, it's jarring because you're like, yeah. oh, this shouldn't be. Like, that's... It yeah. looks wrong. It sounds wrong. Like, and you feel bad for them. Like, yeah, I know they're actresses. And it's like, people blame all oh, the parents. How could the parents let the girls be in this movie? And it's like, well, they probably think, well, maybe they just tell themselves, well, this is their foot in the door. They're going to have promising careers. The parents probably need money. Maybe they're just do whatever you can to get into showbiz. Right. So it's just sad too. And it, and people are like, well, how can you judge cuties when there's like, you know pageant moms and other shows about pageants that are just as bad and how can you judge cuties when like every girl that's in a dance troupe is dancing like that and it does not make it okay it's just like well that's what i felt as i was watching it and i was like you know there if they if they couldn't make it without showing that and giving that some sort of normalcy to it then maybe it doesn't need to be made and if you want to watch it, because I am not for censorship. And, but in my mind, I was like, all I thought was if you're the kind of person that didn't make you sad, we probably wouldn't get along because I wouldn't want you, because you have no problem. You know, my wife and I have a, a friend who has a 13 year old daughter, 12 year old daughter. And we all went out before COVID to Dave and Buster's. We all went Aww. out and had this great time. And, and this little 12 year old girl is playing um, you know, a machine gun game or something. She's having fun and she gets all her tickets. You know, get you those tickets at David yes, Buster's. it's like get... very addictive, yeah. So her mom said to her, so then we went over to get our toys, whatever you get with your little tip tickets. And she said, okay, we're going to be here like 30 minutes because she never knows what to pick. 
And my wife said something to me on the way home and it really hit me. My wife said, you know, and my wife as a girl said, it was really sweet because you could see she's becoming a woman because she's like 12 or 13 years old, but she's still a kid. She's still like getting her tickets and she's going and she's getting a stuffed animal or whatever, whatever. And she said, in two years, that'll be a totally different person because all of a sudden she'll have to be and act a certain way around her friends in school. Wow. And she'll be, you know, and I remember thinking, yeah, there's just a brief period where, they're, where, you, where they get to be kids. And it's and, also like a step into womanhood because some girls mature, their bodies mature faster, like depending on like yeah. what ethnicity is, you know, like right. some girls get their periods at eight. I didn't get mine until I was 14 at fucking gymnastics camp or whatever. So it's like, <laughs> it's taking advantage. And I fell on the beam, like I fell on the beam in a straddle position and I was like, cool, I broke my vagina. It's bleeding. Like, yeah. nice. That feels like something that should be in a movie, but it's that sounds and, like cuties part two. Oh God, <laughs> the gymnastics coach. <laughs> and it's like, you're taking it. It's like, almost like uh, there's such an opportunity there. You're like taking advantage of these girls that maybe are a little bit on the earlier side of developing. Maybe their minds are like going there a little bit, but you're not supposed to like foster that. You're not supposed to throw, you know what I mean? Like it's your job as the adult to be like, no, you have to stay a kid and you have to develop. It's a beautiful way of saying it. That's a you're good way of saying it, that it's, right. You're going to be fucked up um, for years to come. You know what I mean? Like it's therapy for years, or you could just be a kid for, you know, another couple my of years. My son is three years old and I got in a fight with my father-in-law <clears throat> and we've since made up because he was cursing around my son and I asked him not to curse. I said, just don't curse because we're not cursing in front of him. And you know, if you watch my act, you know, I'm as sexual as they come. As do it, but, there's, but my wife and I have, word two words that we say constantly time and place time and place time and place just because you don't want your kid being around christmas doesn't mean you have to be some sort of christian angel walking around all the time either my wife and i do crazy stuff with all kinds of other people and couples and what we do but there's a time and place for that and with our son my thinking is he's gonna be a little boy for this amount of time in his life and I want him to be a little boy. I want him to find the joy in picking up caterpillars outside. I don't want him to start saying, oh, these fucking caterpillars. I just don't want him you to- You don't want him to hump adult. the caterpillars. <laughs> yeah, well, that I'm okay uh, with. But, you know, so, so that's all I know is having a son, you want to give them their childhood. And I think you just put it in a beautiful way. So if you're the mom to one of those kids, is it so important to you to take away that, because that's all they get and then they're adults and life sucks the rest of their lives. And once and you go there, have, you know, you're not, you don't go back. No, There's no, back. yeah. And it just made me feel sad. And there's things in life that make me feel sad. And if I ever see, when I hear about, and I think we're similar, if I hear about, and I make jokes about everything. I am so against cancel culture. I used to have a joke in my act that everyone loved about a rape whistle. And all of a sudden one day you can't make jokes about rape whistles. And so I had to take well, all this stuff out. <laughs> I really want to hear the joke. The joke was, and it was, it's on one of my CDs and I listen to it now and I'm like, you know, I was a very successful comedian with jokes like this, but I just said, have you ever been having sex with a girl? And you could tell she's just not into it. She's just sitting there blowing her rape whistle. <laughs> <laughs> That was the joke. Just She's just sitting there and, and like, you know, one day I couldn't do that joke anymore. So oh, I'm God. so far from like the guy that think like, I'm not, a, I'm not like a pastor, but I'm really, really into childhood. I'm really, really into like, I had my childhood stolen from me. I was having sex way too young. That's what it you is. said that you yeah. were in a situation at 11 years old, you were being told you were hot and that was validating to you. And, and, and so if we're, can we be a little better than that? Can we at least give our kids their childhoods? Because we know what it's like to have it ripped away from us. And if you can't do that, I think there's something missing in you. Yeah, you know, you know, I wish I had gotten um, instead of, and it's like uh, the sex ed or whatever the shit you do in middle school is like, very much instilled fear. Like uh, that's why I held off on sex for so long. I was so afraid. I was like, I'm going to get AIDS. I'm going to die. That's what's going right. to happen. And I just was like a, you know, a PhD in cock tease prude. I would be like, I would, I was like the everything, but girl, I mean, except for, but that was college. Right. But I just was like, whoop, I had a firm stopping point And I was like, all right, it was almost nice in a way. Cause I knew that I was like, sex was like really intimidating to me. So 
Oh, what was my point? Um, Talking about being kids and being validated by stuff like that. Oh, this is what I wish I had. Instead of like being taught to be afraid of sex, I wish that my either my parents or my school, whatever, sometimes they fill in each other's gaps of raising kids. It's It happens. But I wish I had gotten the message of like value yourself, love yourself, the self-worth shit. Even though I was like a good little like student athlete, I was like really into right. diving, like really doing well. But I just... And that's why I leaned so hard into that because I was like, oh, if I accomplish, if I get first place all the time, then I'm going to feel whatever I need to feel that I'm missing from my parents. And that, that was nice, but that was like another, that was over here. But I needed was like the love and just right. the self-worth stuff. And I think if you have that, you're not going to be blowing dudes at 14. You're not going to, I think if you're just like- 100%, yep. Full, my wife full and I, like, yeah. We constantly say- because I was watching porn way too young. I was watching porn 13 years old and having sex at 13 years old. And I keep saying to my wife, if we do the right job with our son, those things, smoking pot at a young age, jerking off at a young age, all that kind of stuff will not be something that's available to him or even think thinks of because he'll be so busy practicing for his soccer game doing, writing his speeches, going on hikes with his mom and dad. Like that, those are the things that you find when there's something missing and you're looking for something to make you feel Drugs good. Drugs too, right. Like all the goth kids mm -hmm. that have no, that not, not into sports or an instrument or, or like yeah, anything, right. right? They get into fucking like carving shit into their arm and like yes, dying, yes. dying their hair weird. Not yeah. like there's anything wrong with yeah. their hair dying, but yeah. And my parents did nothing with me. So that was a sense of, you know, I'm lucky enough to like spend so much time with my son that the, the idea of him like being alone in a room, just like trying to find porn would be odd to him because that's something lonely kids do. Like I did it cause it was lonely. You know, my wife was very, um, you know, promiscuous when she was young, similar to you because the same thing, she didn't have a family life. So she was looking for validation in some way, how cool she was. So that's the kind of things that we look for when you don't have that, when your child is ripped away from you. Which sucks because as, at 11, I was so fucking cool. Like, I wish yeah. I could go back and tell myself, like, you're cool. You have a lot going on. Um, like, I just remember, like, 11 was great because I, like, joined the diving team. And, like, it was such a rush because my coach would dive me up in, like, categories older. I remember I was, like, yeah. maybe 12 years old. And I would, I would dive against 17-year-olds. And I would kick their ass. And it was, like, the fucking best. Like, can you imagine? <laughs> like, you're, like, oh, you're getting beat by somebody who's – like a kid still uh that was the best and um, yeah i remember being in seventh yeah, grade yeah right you were I got, a cool yeah. kid yeah yeah i was yeah. in seventh grade i got contacts so i could like see the diving board that was a game changer um yeah that was i was like, really i artistic. was a writer yeah yeah i was a writer i was and i would make people laugh all the time and i remember in school um we used to have this thing and this is like third or fourth grade chrissy like we had this thing where every day we'd read a chapter of a book and she'd pick another kid from the class to read the book. And one day the kids all got together and they voted. They said, we all voted and we want Mitch to read the book from now on every day because he reads it so funny because he makes us Aww. all laugh. And the teacher said, okay. So that was like my introduction to performing at the beginning of every class. Wow. Mitch would go up and I would read to the class and I would make it funny. And looking back, I'm like, why didn't I have a mom or dad telling me like, that is really cool. My mom and dad yeah. didn't even give a shit or probably don't even know the story even happened. That's they didn't a, care. That's really cool. You could have been, that's, that's the thing. And that's like, wow, it really like levels you up as a kid. Cause you're like, Ooh, those, the early yeah. signs of like, I have a skill and not every kid has it. And it's like, right. it's like the beginning footprints of like who you could become. It's like, you could have done politics. You could have been, yeah. yeah. Stand up comic. It's like, whatever. You could have been a crackhead or something. Um, I mean, there's always time to be a crackhead, I guess. Um, yeah, and for some, <laughs> and for somebody Suddenly, like yourself, you lost me on the like no crack thing. We were getting uh, all, like, uh... <laughs> all right, fine, all right, fine. Keep the crack, um, Mitch. For somebody who was NYU Tisch educated, like you're very down to earth and not like uh, you know someone I would expect, and you know stereotypical like yeah acting school New York City you know artsy yeah. kid. I didn't belong there. Who? I didn't belong in NYU. I went to NYU to make there? my mom happy. Well, I, made, I wanted to make my mom happy. They told me that I couldn't make a living in stand-up comedy. 
which if I've ever forgiven them for anything, it's that because I understand <laughs> they that, like, were right. <laughs> you can't really make a living in stand-up comedy. It's a crazy thing. It's like saying that you're going to be a quarterback of a football team. There's actually, you know, yeah. the, 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 the chance that you can make a living doing stand-up comedy is, is just absurd. I think it's and, also, they need to really tell people like, you need to be okay with being broke. You know, like it's possible, but like, just know that your standards for life need to go way down and stay there for a while if not forever, because you might not. Well, what I, what I always tell people is there are two different kinds of people in, in careers. There are people who want something and there's people who need something. The people who need something are usually going to have an advantage because they're willing to give up everything to get it. And while my friends were getting married and having kids and buying houses, I was a waiter at 25 years old being ordered around by pieces of shit like to go get, you know, to go, I was getting yelled at by these Greek uh, diner owners in New York, just yelling in my face, like just regular, on me. regular diner old owners. <laughs> yeah. And I couldn't, and I couldn't, you know, I could say no. Cause I needed, I wanted, I needed to be a stamp comedian so bad. I, and I almost look back at that now and kind of think that's a little bit sad because I almost feel like I've met stand up comedians on the road. I'm sure you have who are funny, but they're like, yeah, I mean, I like doing it, but I'm not going to like give up my family for it or something. And I'm always like, they seem to have kinda... options. Yeah. You're like, huh, yeah, what's that like? I, I yeah. met a guy who was like, yeah, I make some good money with the stock market. So I'll see how far this whole stand up comedy thing goes. But you so fucking, like, I fucking hate those people. I'm like, oh, you make enough money and you just do this whenever you want, you know? <laughs> and I think that's almost better because because if you need something that bad, there's probably something really vacant in your heart that you're trying to fill that you yes. give up so much of life. For sure. There was a month where I was in between boyfriends like six years ago before I met my current boyfriend. Oh, I just got out of the worst relationship I'd ever had. I was like self-esteem below sea level. And there was a literal, an actual month where I would say like out of the 30 days, I think I slept with 22 people. I just was like, next, next, next. I, it was a high. I was like, yeah. I have Google Maps. I mean, Google, well, Google Maps, <laughs> Google Calendar. You know, this was like before Tinder. So this was just Thrinder and like other yeah. apps. And I was just like, yes, yes. And then it would be like just highs and lows. Cause it's like the high is like, ooh, it's like, it's like the chase being desired. And then you have sex and then you feel really sad. Yeah. Like immediately you wake up the next day. Like, yeah. I got, I got to get this somewhere else. Um, and I could have kept going like that. Like had I not met Frank and he sort of helped me like refocus on my career, be like, Hey, you love this thing. Why don't you work smarter instead of harder? And like, just helping cool. me get out of my own way. Um, I think had I not met him, I could have so easily continued on that path, like like a crackhead of just like, I need to fuck everyone because it feels so good, but you don't, you're not like making anything. Yeah, by the way, I want you to know that guys have a similar thing. We can't, of course, just get laid whenever we want, but what I would do on the road and what I realize is it turns into a numbers game for you as a guy. It's just, you have to keep getting your number up and it becomes less about the sex and more about the, uh, my number's like a 75 right now. Yeah. I can get to 80 and it's Achievement like, unlocked. <laughs> you just want it, but you don't even kind of enjoy it. Like it's weird. You're just kind of like clinking it up in your mind. Like, okay, now I'm up to, you know, and then yeah. you meet other guys that are like, I'm at a thousand. And it just, you realize it's like, like What does your dick look like? A thousand. <laughs> Greg Fitzsimmons, he told me on my podcast, he's had over a thousand. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah. And I was like, what? But then there's other guys that have a 10,000, like basketball 10,000? That's probably, um, what's his face? Will Chamberlain. <laughs> yeah. He did. He said he had like 10,000 women. 10,000. Oh my God. It's, it's yeah. the thing is like, as a woman, like you only need to, I think you only really need to have sex with like, I mean, I was up like, you know, I think you maybe you only need to have sex with really like 20 or 25 guys to know like that's probably the scope of ex of sexual experiences that you're gonna have you know because right. I feel like I you know and then you start seeing oh you're this kind of guy you're just like number three or you're just like number 17 right. and you're like yeah. yeah yeah I never I never really enjoyed sex until I met my wife and started doing like real fun stuff with her like that was like what like S&M and shit or swinging you no know, we'd go to like parties and swing and stuff and stuff like that that i was like and 
Like that was the first time I started actually having fun. I think what it was is my wife seems very similar to you in that like she was almost, she was like, I couldn't go after her and try to get her because she was like already wanting to do it. She's like very open sexually, my wife. So when we met, she was like, let's do this. Like, and then she, she loves sex. And so awesome. I never really had to like win her over. So all of a sudden I was like, well, why don't we talk too? And then we started becoming <laughs> friends. Wow. And then like, yeah. So I think that that was, and, like, and then I talk. Started, That's great. just enjoy it. Yeah. That is so funny. That's like very similar to me and Frank, but I feel like it's, we're too much talking now. It's like too much working. And like, I would, we feel, we probably need to swing back, but it's so now easy to get parents. <laughs> stuck in work mode. Oh yeah. yeah. Now you're just Have parents. fun before you have a kid. Have a lot of fun before you have a kid. Uh, well, he has a kid already, so. <laughs> How old is this kid? Uh, nine. Oh, okay. So, so yeah. that's what's, still, you get a little more time to yourself. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And what's crazy is like, I've known this kid for like five years now and he doesn't remember a time when I wasn't in his life, which is like uh, a little- so you're like his mom. It's crazy, but it's also like no pressure, you know? Um, I'm like a fun aunt. Like he definitely still has a mom that he lives with most of the time. I am like- I don't know. I, I feel like I am like a fun aunt type. Like if there's ever anything like physical or like some kind of a dare, or like I'll usually do it first. And I'll be like, see, You'll do walk a dare? the plank. Yeah, I don't know. Or like walk, crawl, like climb something, walk out on something not stable. I don't know. Any kind of like a physical dare. Like, Is he into all his video games? Does he do his video games all the time? Yeah, loves video games, but like, you know, it's not his whole day. Like the same thing, like we'll go on hikes. Yeah. And it's so important because like video games really do something to a kid's brain. And uh, he'll also watch, like, it's always interesting to see like what the kids are watching. <laughs> um, like obviously it's YouTube, but it's these kids, these, well, these guys, I guess they're in their twenties and they talk like this, everything's so exciting. And they're talking about video games. And it, it's, I think it's like crack for there. I keep saying yeah. crack for my example, but it's like, I swear it like pumps up their adrenaline. Like it's just, they're so excited about it's really, heroin. It's about heroin. They've done studies. It's, these, it's, yeah. Yeah. It's more addictive than heroin. And so, and, and, and I think my theory on that is I'm not going to say he's not allowed to play them because, because then it turns into that really, really fun thing that you can't do that it becomes really kind of like, you want. Yeah. And, and so what I said is like, we'll just do it like everything else that's, in, that's fun in life. You earn it. You have a little bit of time with it. You, if you do good, you know, you get a certain amount of time. If you clean, if you do your chores and yeah. that kind of stuff is fun because then you earn that time and you sit, you know, and I think, because I think that when you, when you like, I don't know where you stand on this, but I've always been against like AA because I'm always like the idea of just mm. giving up something is to me like almost to the other extreme. It's almost like, like you're you, giving it more power. You're making it more yes. taboo. And like, maybe it's because yeah. I hear my dad's like strict German voice always in the back of my head. Like you should be able to overcome this without like, like on your own, basically. I don't know if that's like being too proud and people who are in the program are probably like, what the fuck, fuck you, you don't know. Um, because I almost joined whatever it is, SLA or whatever it is for like sex and love addicts after that, like cr my yeah. summer of Chrissy. Uh, I really, right. friends were like, you should really look into this. Like you, you have a problem. <laughs> and I was like, I'm having fun. <laughs> um, what was the point of bringing that up? So that you can get addicted. Like, so they're, so it's not only are they, are they playing video games? They're also watching these YouTubers. They're like hype men. For oh, we were talking about giving it too much power. Yeah. 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 We, giving it too much power. And it's also like, just like, I remember I had an Adderall prescription for years and then. God, I love Adderall. I would, oh, I would take it. Love it. I probably should start doing it again, but I had this, again, his voice in my head being like, you don't, you shouldn't need pills to get your work done. You know, you should just be able to do it. I need Adderall to go to a party. I can get my work done all fine. I just, it makes me, it takes away a little bit of my social anxiety, which okay. is probably not what it's supposed to do, but it does for me. And it's yeah. not only do it when we go to parties. Cause my wife has this weird thing where she likes to meet people. And <laughs> I like to just stay under my yeah. bed and, and, you know, People are what? great. It's so great to meet people. It's like, oh yeah, I'm alive. I'm not just like. I like having... doing this. Yeah. I like doing this. I don't like being at parties. I get very uncomfortable at parties. And so the adult yeah. helps me come out of that. The older um, I've gotten, the more socially weird, socially anxious I get at parties. Cause I walk into a room. I'm like, 
a lot of these people don't like me. You know, I'll just immediately be like, who in here doesn't like me? I think when like you walk me? into parties, people are like, that girl fucked 22 guys in the summer. I think that's what they're saying. <laughs> and they're all here. Surprise. That's <laughs> <laughs> your intervention. Hey, uh, Christy, I want to visit something you just said, which was really cool, which you said, I know people are going to be writing into the show and saying, oh, well, you shouldn't say that, whatever. And the thing that I get, gets me so weirded out by anything is like, you're allowed to say anything you want you don't have to agree with it. Like, this is what's so weird about our society that I'm like, I'm saying I don't believe in AA. I'm not saying that if you believe in AA that you have to write now and say, it's helped so many people and how dare you say it? But I was, I'm always like, that's, that we've gotten away from this idea that like, you're allowed to have an opinion that someone else's opinion isn't. And people seem to get so yeah. upset and write into shows and stuff. And I'm like, like I said, is I thought Cuties was freaking horrible. I didn't go on Twitter and start writing about it. You didn't spend like, your okay. day, yeah. It just made me sad. It just made me sad. And and it's not my job now to go and tell other people, you know, and have these fights back and forth. And that's what right. I think people are looking for now. It's weird. It's actually the most like selfish kind of egotistical move like cancel culture and i've talked about this on other episodes with other comics it's like when you go into cancel mode you're saying my thoughts beliefs values are more important than everybody yep. else and i Just mean like honestly yep. pedophilia aside because i feel like that's pretty fucked up and unforgivable but like again i'm not into cancel culture but it's like all right if someone enjoys this thing okay i'm probably not gonna like whoever enjoys this film like as a person, I'm not going to probably like want to interact with them or be friends or anything, right. but right. should it exist? Eh, it's, I'm not going to write to have it taken down, I guess. I don't know. I'm really particularly very torn on cuties, but like in general for most other things. Yeah. Like, I don't know either because I, yeah. would, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the answer to things. I just know that I'm allowed to have an opinion. I know that it's not allowed to, it doesn't have to be your opinion. I know that like, I shouldn't feel bad for saying a word anymore. I shouldn't feel bad for saying that I think that this guy's a bad guy or this guy's a good guy. And, and, and people shouldn't think that it's okay to attack anyone that thinks differently than them because they know the right way to do things. And, and, and listen, we're not gonna get cuties kicked off the air. We're not going to there's gonna be a certain segment of society that's going to want to fight and say that they wanna watch that. I would, as the most, as the dirtiest comic you will ever see, people watch my material, it's as dirty as can be. I remember thinking the, when the big Janet Jackson thing cause she showed her nipple at the Super Bowl happened. I remember thinking like, just like my wife and I always say time and place. If you're sitting down with your son to watch a, or, or daughter to watch a football game, it's not where you're expecting to see a woman's nipple in, in a, halftime show if that's what that's sold as that's fine and then people would be like well everybody's getting all crazy and everybody's being crude and i'm like no people are simply saying tell me what i'm watching am i watching a yeah. football game or am i watching a girl dancing naked am i watching a watching. titty show <laughs> yeah and so that's my whole thing is that we're getting to this point where people are looking for you to get upset at something to show how much hipper they are than you and you know something you've got a lot of issues if that's what you're looking for. That's what I'm saying. If you're watching this show or any show and you can't wait to write in because you don't agree with what me or Chrissy said, there's something wrong with you. You're, you're so small as a person that you need that person to fight with to, to show how you're valuable in life. And you don't need to do that to show you're valuable. You hear that stuttering John? No. <laughs> he loves bringing me up on his podcast all the time. Oh, does he break... Yeah, he doesn't like to call my name. He calls me that ditzy girl. But then he shouted out my boyfriend, Frank, and then the White Plains Comedy Club because he's like, let me know what club it is so I can not talk about it. And then in his next episode, he's like, White Plains Comedy Club, that place sucks. I'm like, that place is not even open. The clubs like in New York are not even open yet. Um, he's, I think I just got in his head. Yeah. No, he's just a very self-destructive guy. You hit a nerve with him. You made him feel something that he didn't want to admit he feels. And now he's got to destroy you to make himself feel better. But He'll why? probably do the same thing. Yeah. yeah. That's what people do. We don't have to feel bad about that. You know what I mean? Like it's not no. the worst thing in the world that he's not getting on stage four times a week. You know what I mean? It's like, it's not the worst thing in the world if he's not like constantly touring. Like why is that? The, it doesn't make a difference. You know. it, what does it matter? There, there are people that hate me as a comedian. I, I'm just going to keep writing my jokes 
And if I said to my wife, my wife is like, how long will you do this for? I've been doing it 30 years, Chris. And I'm always like, well, how much am I going to do for it? I'm like, I just love writing and I'm financially you know, stable at this point. And I'm like, if people keep calling me to do shows, I'm trying to sell a special on Netflix or, uh, or uh, Showtime or, you know, I have a great new special out called Bad Girls that's out for sale right now. It is. Where can they so get it? Good. No, it's out for sale to like Netflix or oh. you know, we're waiting for one of those companies. If, it, if they buy it, which they should, because it'll be a huge hit. I mean, it's great. It's the best stand-up I've ever done. Then I'll probably get another round where I tour again and make another couple million dollars and I'll love it. But if not, then I'll sit home wow. and I'll enjoy my son. A it's just, dollars. that's the point you get to in life where you're like, I'll take what I can get. If John is so, if that bothered him so much, I mean, honestly, Christy, I watched it and I was so proud of you. Oh, really? You I know, that's me, how we started talking. It like made my day. You hit me up. I was like, oh my God. Well, if you said to me, I hear you dabble in set of comedy, I would have laughed hysterically and been like, well, yeah, maybe a dabble. I mean, like, I wouldn't, it wouldn't even bother me. You want to know why? Because I'm a successful stand up comedian. Mm -hmm. Because that wouldn't bother me, that word. You can if, take that a number of ways. And also, it's a fucking pandemic. Everyone's dabbling right now. It doesn't make a difference what you said. The point is, is that self destructive is a word that is associated with stuttering John. And, and, and he's a self destructive person. He knows he is. This is going to bother him. He's going to probably be bad mouthing me. I don't care. Anybody that listens to Stuttering John probably shouldn't be coming to my shows. We're not going to, we're not, it's not going to be, they're going to want well written comedy. You should go with the cutest people. They're not, you're not going to like They're not them. my yeah. people. They're not my people. <laughs> hmm. So, it, was he and, kind of this way even as an intern or like, you know, younger, earlier? I don't on? know much about him because mm -hmm. I didn't like him. <laughs> I mean, I didn't like his personality, so I stayed away from him. And uh, and then when he got really famous with the Howard Stern show, I was happy for him. And then I thought about working with him a couple of months ago, maybe six or seven months ago. I thought, oh, maybe we could do a Howard Stern reunion tour with me, him, and Jackie. And uh, he decided to go on air and make fun of... Jackie the Joke Man, who's the guy that we're going to do the tour with. A great guy. And yeah. Just and I was like, all right, well, you know, that's, and he ruined the idea of us going out on tour. And, I, and you know, we, and then he blocked me because I guess he wanted to talk about me on his podcast. And I remember thinking like, you can't, you can't bother me. You're not someone, you know, in order to really be upset by somebody, you have to really respect them. Hmm. you really have to right I mean yeah. Howard Stern when I went on the Tonight Show when I went on the Letterman Show for the first time because I've done a little more than dabble in comedy and when <laughs> I went on the Letterman Show Howard called me and told me that he was proud of me that's wow. he was my childhood hero like that's that's important to me if somebody who is a bad person to other people doesn't like me I'm doing something right. Yeah. That's another, like, as you get older lesson uh, for me, I probably came a little bit later than it should have, but like the, not everyone is going to like you. Not everyone should like you because no. if you're Amen. like becoming more of who you are and who you're supposed to be and like aligning with your purpose, like you should be pissing yeah. people off because that means you're like really honing in on your people. And then you're really honing in on like your values, your message, all yeah. that shit. Yeah, Thank there's you. a girl, there's a girl that I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but there's a female comedian who, who I'm friends with in Colorado who made, made a statement about a statue being taken down and how stupid it was that people were getting upset. And people attacked her like she was a Nazi, like, and she's a good human being. Wow. And, and her dad came to my show with her. She was opening for me. And, and I sang to her and her dad said, I told her if it's the people who really count, they'll understand all the other people are just showing you who they really are. And they're showing you that they're not really your friends and who you should be friends with. And I always say, it's like, if you're a girl and you find out a guy's cheating on you and really being deceitful and stuff, although it hurts, it's almost a gift. Cause you're like, Oh, that's who you, that's who I would have spent my life with that person. Ugh, you know? Yeah. 
So it's almost like you're a sifter and it's like the sifters got to move so that things can fall through. Yes. I don't know. I'm, I, I like just it. like, I really love a metaphor and I think every episode I, I'll do one you, metaphor you, that really bombs. <laughs> well, you dabble in metaphors. I've noticed. Yeah. I'm definitely a dabbler of metaphors. Like I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't say I'm a professional headlining down you know metaphor person <laughs> yeah i do love the metaphors they really do clear up life for you don't they they make it more beautiful <laughs> they do yeah they really do so i mean i did want to know because like you you did this podcast it's like where you kind of draw the parallels between like comedy and fighting um were you athletic as a youth like were you into fighting younger or did you no, get into it no i wasn't and i think that's why i adore mma so much i've always had no issues getting on stage and i've had people tell me how courageous i am i've never ever not walked on stage no matter how nervous i've been <clears throat> i've never said no to a gig i've never and my wife always says to me you should be so proud of that but on the other hand i get so scared of fighting fighting scares me i don't know why it's just in my mind, I get scared of fighting and get scared mm -hmm. of getting hurt. Oh, uh, so yeah, I'm the same people, way. I just don't like the tension. I don't like how the air feels before there's a yes. fight. Like, I don't like how the energy feels when there's like, ooh, so much tension or like, you know, like yeah. if someone's hurt, I'll help them. I like can't help myself, you know? Right, right. And I would like jump to like, whatever, save a kid from a car or whatever. But like, yeah, I just don't, ooh, fight the fighting vibes. Well, yeah, I've never yeah. wanted to fight. I just, I loved stand-up comedy and I loved that excitement and that, that adrenaline of getting on stage. I've gotten on stage in the worst of situations. I was opening for like rock bands at Lollapalooza where like people would start booing me. And then I always loved that feeling. And I loved it even when I came off and I was, I died and was booed. I loved that feeling. I never wanted to fight. And you so- You liked being booed? I, I liked anything that had to do <clears throat> with performing. I liked the high of putting myself in a situation that was scary and doing it whether I did good or not. Ooh. I loved that feeling, but I hated fighting. And so fighters appealed to me, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice, because I thought just like there's something missing in me because most people are scared of public speaking, but I, I love that feeling. People who don't, people who aren't scared to go and get punched in the face and get potentially knocked out in front of millions of people, there's something to me very cool about that. So I wanted to get into their psyche. I wanted to learn who they were as people. That's why that appealed to me. Um, and um, yeah, that was really important to me. Uh, so, and I yes. want my son to learn to fight because yeah. I was scared of it. And one of the things I've learned in interviewing fighters is to them getting hit in the face is not that big a deal. And now that I look at it, I'm like, just like to us getting on stage is not that big a deal. Like, like you'll live. They don't yeah. think getting, you know, and I think, yeah, I want to teach my son if a bully comes over, like the one lesson I wish I could talk to little Mitch about besides blowing 22 guys in a month, which is a whole other story. <laughs> hey, I didn't but, blow all, well, pro I probably, some of those were women. All right. All right. That's awesome. The point. But <laughs> it actually makes it kind of exciting. But, 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 but if I could talk to little Mitch, what I would say, Chrissy, is I would say like, I can promise you I know one thing about bullies. They're not looking for a hard target. They're looking for the easiest target. And if a bully, because I used to get bullied because I was small, I'm only 5'5". Five five. <clears throat> if I had just known or had someone explain to me, just go crazy, just go nuts, and just scream and hit the kids, like the next time they're going to be like, that's not an easy target. Bullies are like looking- like a, a Bart Simpson where you're like, anything. Ah, like if you hit, kick yeah. the air. I don't know. Yeah, just just do something. Just do something instead of run. I never ran. But I remember like I was there was this kid William who used to pick on me all the time at, at school every day. He would just keep picking on me and picking on me and picking on me. And one day, Chrissy, like something just snapped. I had I was taking a bike chain off of my bike and I just started going like you. I just went crazy and started whipping this chain around, following <laughs> around. And he ran he ran home oh my crying. God. I was because this crazy kid was chasing him with a chain. You're like an action and, figure now. You're like, Papa! <laughs> the Mitch action figure comes with its own chain. Don't you know that that kid never bothered me again? Like, 
that's the lesson wow. that I take from it that I wish I had a dad to explain to me. Just take a chance yeah. and go nuts. Maybe you'll get hit in the face a couple of times, but you'll the joy you'll get from never being bothered again will be endless. And it's also about knowing that like sometimes it's like just about how it looks, you know? Like I think probably a lot of bullies don't even want to fight. They just want to like feel superior and, you know, that if they just if no one's challenging them, then they'll just keep at it. But if you're like if you meet them where they are, well then it kind of ruins their whole thing. Yep. But it's all hard. I was never is, I was never bullied, so what the hell do I know? All, all a bully is is someone who has been made to feel very small. You know, we, we were talking about cuties and pedophilia. And the reason why it should hurt your heart so much is because there's, n I'm going to sound so silly now, but there's nothing like a childhood innocence. And if you could take advantage of that innocence to make yourself feel better, Ugh. you're evil. You're yeah. evil. You're evil. And, and all these bullies are, are kids whose innocence were taken away from by their parents because they're made to feel smaller than their parents or probably beat the shit out of them. And in order to feel so important, finally, because they don't have the self-esteem, it's to find the one kid that they can then bully to make themselves feel like I'm in some sort of control because now I'm taking advantage of somebody else's innocence. Mm -hmm. So all you need to do is show them that you're not going to be that kid and they'll leave you alone. I mean, if there's any kids getting bullied out there watching our show, first of all, you shouldn't be watching this show because we're talking Turn about it off right now. You should have turned it off right away. But just take a bike chain. and Take a bike chain and a whip it around like you're Wonder Woman. Yes. Yes, <laughs> just hurt that person. <laughs> I was never bullied, but Shaniqua, what the hell was her last name? Oh, I forget. But she challenged me to a fight in middle school by the Spanish deli. We had a Spanish deli and a regular deli. That tells you about where I grew up. <laughs> the Spanish deli was actually way fucking cooler. It had like yeah. cheaper bacon, egg, and cheese sandwiches, like all the loose candy. I would take you a know? Spanish. Yeah, yes, I would take a Spanish it was. Burger. It was actually like my first bodega, but no one was calling it bodega because it was like Rockwell Center. And they were like, "It's the they don't speak mm. English." Oh, it's you know, everyone's like going to the expensive deli i'm like oh with your white paper sandwiches your white paper bagel sandwiches no thanks you know i'm gonna eat fucking pork rinds <laughs> yes <laughs> you know? get some some culture. so yeah shaniqua was like challenged me to a fight behind the spanish deli i was there she didn't show up which like just that was a grace of god moment because she was way taller than me and scrappier and I, i'm sure i would have lost but yeah, I can't believe. Yeah, but the, the thing is, is as kids, we're taught so much that it's win or lose. And that's actually one of the things about UFC that I love about it. There are so many fighters that are badasses, but someone has to lose. They get their shit. They learn so fast, Chrissy, that like winning and losing is such a part of their lives. No matter how good you are, you're probably going to get shit beat out of you sooner or later. Yeah, we almost like it's the same. Almost it's like winning and losing is like, eh. It's equally you know, you possible. Just, you know, you just, you just made me realize something really prophetic in my life. I think one of the reasons I didn't want to fight as a kid was I felt that if I lost, I would be worthless because I didn't have self-esteem. And I didn't understand that like self-esteem is sticking up for yourself, win or lose. But that's yes. why you stick up for yourself, not because you're going to win. Going on stage and being funny isn't the way you win. Going on stage is how you win. It doesn't matter how you do. It matters that you put yourself in a tough situation. If you start to get better and better and you're funnier and funnier, then that's just icing on the cake. But the lesson I'll teach my son and what I've learned from these fighters also is like, I always tell these fighters who talk about how bad they feel sometimes when they lose. And I'm like, you got in a cage and fought another human being with millions of people watching you. Like, you already won. You bit a man's ear off and spit it at him. You know? well, I don't know if I agree with that, Chrissy. And we were on the same page <laughs> until you brought up that analogy. Because that metaphor, that metaphor doesn't work. <laughs> oh, man. Right, because it's not about the result. It's about the pursuit. Thank you. It's yes. Just, How do we yeah. teach that to the kids of America? That's like the kids of the world. How do we teach that? It's, it's about how to, Yeah, it's about... It you have to put them in something where it's repetition. You got to get the tries up. Like, how did I get that? I got that because I was a diver. I was constant. You do like 500 dives a day. It's like, you're constantly yes. faced with rejection. You're constantly have to do it yep. over and over and over again. You smack your head. Like, you know, you freaking, 
you know, you smack the water, everything's on fire. You have to do it again. Tough shit. And I think anything yeah. where there's that repetition, playing an instrument, any kind of sport, any yes. even dance. And as an adult doing stand up, it's a th- it's like at this point we both like, yeah, I'll like I'll run towards rejection. I'll like run towards failure. I've like, ran into just... it so many times. Yeah. My my little boy broke my heart the other day because we were at the beach where's a couple months ago and uh he's so gregarious he loves meeting people he's he's two and a half or almost three and he always goes i want to meet sens i want to go meet sens which is friends and he walks right over to them and says like what what can you want to be sens you want to be sens and so usually yeah usually the kids want to play but he went over to two like snotty little girls playing in their sandcastle and he was like hi do you want to be sens and the girls gave him that look that all guys know. They were like, no. Like, they just gave him this look. But he didn't even know it was rejection. But I felt so bad that he's going to have to feel that one day. Aww. That that girl who just looks at him like he's an idiot for asking her out. And I, I hope he gets the lesson that, like, you're never the idiot for taking the chance. You're never the idiot for taking the chance. You know, and, and you're on the other side, you're a woman. So I hope that you've been in situations where if someone asked you out respectfully or not, you know, only respectfully, really, that you were that you'd be like, oh, no, thank you. I'm not into dancing right now. Like, I've seen girls be really mean to guys. Yeah, I've, and I've seen guys be really mean to girls. I've seen it both ways. Human beings shouldn't be mean to each other. They should be respectful. Yeah. And what you can tell your son um whenever this happens to him like right just tell him like hey that girl is gonna suck someone's dick she doesn't want to one day <laughs> probably dozens of dicks that she doesn't want to suck and she's gonna suck them because i'm gonna give my son your number <laughs> <laughs> oh no <laughs> aunt chrissy is gonna be calling yeah just know that like what however bad if she's making you feel right now she's gonna feel so right. much worse because she's not gonna be able to say no to anal and uh right. And because that's also the kind of woman that if she needs to be mean, she probably has something missing in herself to feel that powerful over somebody. Wow, that's really psychological. Wow. But yeah. Really? And, but, that's, it, but that's a bully. That's a bully. And at the same time, you know, I saw once something that stuck with me because it was the meanest thing a guy's ever done. A guy walked over to a girl in a bar. I remember seeing this. I wrote a joke about it. And he goes, uh, do you want to dance? And she was really nice. She said, oh, no, thank you. I'm staying with my friend. And he goes, well, you got a fat ass anyway. And, and. It's like, you wanted to dance with this fat ass. (laughs) And I remember thinking like, well, first of all, I remember thinking that's a gift to her that she knows she said no to the right person. Like I thought, if you really want to make her feel bad, go, oh, okay, well, I'm sorry. I think you're, I think whatever. Cause Cause she'll come over to you in about 20 minutes. Cause she's going to think about that and knock it around. And she'll be like, you know what? He's not that bad looking, you know? Yeah, he was a nice guy. And so, but, but again, like he should, like he, he showed himself to be a bully. Like that's why you're who you are. Like it's just, it's interesting that it all works out like that. And he's probably blowing a bunch of guys and taking anal now too. Mm-hmm. I don't know how that works, but mm-hmm. whatever. Maybe that guy is me now. I don't know. Maybe I'm that guy who called her with a fat ass. You, we're all, well, you we're have all a way of getting guy. it out of us, Chrissy. You have a way of getting it out of us. Do I really? <laughs> yeah. You're a good interviewer. Oh, thanks. Wow. I thank you for not getting upset that I took uh, notes about you and I was reading questions off of a paper. So. Oh, no, I do that when I do my podcast. That was uh, Stuttering John got upset that I was reading questions off of a notebook. I was like, he didn't even John... know what show he was doing of mine. <laughs> Stuttering John gets upset that when he looks in the mirror, he's Stuttering John. <laughs> get out on the entire world because of that and yell at everybody and make everybody feel bad and i i don't know who's i'm like imagine trust is, is yeah listening to him but I'm, let them enjoy him i'm sure these- some days there's like music playing and stuttering john looks in the mirror and takes a long hard look and he's like some days i just want to be john <laughs> <laughs> Hey, can I ask you a question? I'm sorry to say I haven't watched the whole interview yet, but I'm traveling. I'm staying right now with family in Arkansas. I'm about to get in my car and go to St. Louis uh, to perform. At Helium, uh, October at Helium. 1st through 3rd. So what I'm, gonna, what I'm saying is, so yeah, come see my show if you're out there. I'm going to listen to the whole Stuttering John podcast <laughs> on that trip. But can you just tell me this little preview? Like, was the whole thing that kind of like... Uh, Tense? Edgy? 
tense yeah no the first um 20 to 30 minutes of it was really really good because i was asking him questions about howard stern and he probably assumed because right he's up here he had me like down here in terms of like personhood i guess right he probably assumed i had him on to just like kiss his ass the whole time uh, and he went in thinking he was like such a get and uh, I don't know. I think he, he, pro he also sounds like someone who surrounds himself with like, people of all the same opinions as him. So he's like never challenged plus huge ego plus thinks he's doing me a favor by doing my podcast when it's really like, dude, you could have canceled at any point. You know, uh, I would have not lost sleep over it. Um, yeah, but I got bad news for you, Chrissy. If Stuttering John is your get, you wouldn't have sponsors. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> If, if, if that's what you're going to town with when you get your sponsors and say, hey, didn't you have like a really big guest on recently that I saw? Um, was like, Roger Stone? Yes, you had Roger Stone. That's a get. Man, yeah, oh, man. he's a cool I mean, dude. A, yeah, we talked about pizza. Guy, you want to know what excited me about that? Whether you like him or not, that's a piece of history. Like whenever, like, listen, I'm not a Bill Clinton fan, but I met Bill Clinton at a Super Bowl. And like, I shook his hand and I was like, that is a piece of history. Like, like Clinton is going to be like, he's a president. Like that blows me away. And he's Roger not just Stone, a president. He's like, he's like really deep. You know what I mean? Like he's got his finger in a lot of pots. Like he's very yeah. influential. Yeah. So to meet someone that's reached that level. So Roger Stone to me is a guy who I was like, he's entrenched in like history. So in effect, you were talking to history. That's just cool to me. Like, I remember yeah. one time Joe Pesci saw me on stage and called me into audition for a movie that he was thinking of doing. Joe Pesci called me and it, like, I got on the phone, Joe no. no, Pesci. And I was like, N of course it's not Joe Pesci. But then I realized like, oh my God, Joe Pesci is calling me. And he said he wanted to meet me. I saw you at the comedy cellar. I like, think you're funny, I want to meet you. So I went in to meet Joe Pesci, and as I'm sitting there talking to him, I'm like, Goodfellas, Casino, like, this Home is- Home Alone, you're running, you're running, you're running, you're running with the burnt head, oh my God. It's Joe Pesci, and so yeah. anytime that we intersect in our lives with history, to me, just gives you a sense that you're a little, I don't even want to, I don't know what the word is, maybe you can help me, but you're a little closer almost to like the world for Does sure. That make sense? Yeah, like, it is. It's like uh it's like a moment in time or it's like everything's in a loop. And I think if you're constantly growing and changing, like you're always moving. You're always like, and if you're in line with like purpose source, all that yeah. new agey shit, it's almost like it's something where it's like you land on it and whoosh, it speeds you up into the next thing. You know, it's like a like a booster. I don't know. I can't explain it. I don't have a metaphor this time, but it's like, yeah, it's a moment where you're like, ah, like things are going well. It feels like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be right now. You know, yeah. especially when you meet someone like that and it goes well. You're like, oh shit. It's pretty cool. I would love to keep talking, but my, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, 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 no. But I'm just want to tell you why. My thing just popped up on my Mac. It said low battery. Okay. Your Mac will sleep soon unless plugged into a power outlet. I, oh, yeah. I could go find a power thing. But no, we're I don't know. done. But this was like this was like great and plenty. Can and we do it again? Can yes, we do it again? let's do it again. Let's do it again. Mitch, uh, where can people find you, follow you, support you? So my Twitter is at Mitch Fatel, M I T C H F A T E L. Facebook is facebook.com slash Mitch Fatel, Mitch Fatel.com. Don't have a lot of shows because of COVID, but I am at St. Louis this week. Call Netflix and Showtime and HBO Max and tell them to buy my special. Maybe I get a second go around in the stand-up comedy thing and you get to come see me dabble in my uh, <laughs> jokes. You come to see me dabble. I would love to see you dabble. I love you, Chrissy. <laughs> oh, I love you, I love you too. This is great. You're, really, you're awesome. And best of luck to you. And, and you seriously, uh, you have... You have balls and you're really cool and you're down to earth and, and I really appreciate you having me on. Oh, thanks, Mitch. We'll we'll do this again soon. Sounds good.